Hello and welcome to the first video in this unit that we're talking about 19th century political developments. There will be three of these videos, but this first one is about Napoleon and the Congress of Vienna. So here's the big picture. The French Revolution left a powerful legacy for world history, including secular society breaking away from religion, um, nationalism, and democratic ideas. But those democratic ideas didn't last that long because Napoleon... Uh, attempted to unify Europe under French domination as the Emperor of France, but he was ultimately unsuccessful. The Congress of Vienna attempted to restore Europe uh, to how it had been before the French Revolution and Napoleonic conquest, but again, eh, only temporarily successful. Let's talk about Napoleon Bonaparte. So he was born in poverty in Corsica, which is an island in the Mediterranean, um, but he proved himself to be an excellent general in campaigns in Italy and Egypt, doing really incredible feats of military prowess. And then that post-revolutionary government uh, that was left over after the reign of terror and um, all the really negative parts of the sort of end of that revolution period, it's called the Directorate, and it was really weak and wasn't particularly effective as a government. But Napoleon was a really effective general, and it turned out he was also a fair politician. So he ended up taking power in 1802 and became the first emperor of France in 1804. And this is an incredible oversimplification of this man's life, and he's a fascinating figure, but he's not the focus of our story. So here's what happened. After he came into power, France was kind of already at war with various groups because they were all, all these other countries were nervous about this revolution thing. Um, but then Napoleon made that even worse. Uh, by 1803, Britain, Austria, Russia, Sweden, and Naples all declared war on France. Um, Napoleon conquers most of Europe in response, <laughs> which is super impressive. He beats um, basically all those other countries' armies and conquers Spain, Portugal, Prussia, Italy, and a bunch of others, and unifies them into this one giant French empire with some small client states that he puts his family in charge of. Um, but then Napoleon makes a really terrible mistake and invades Russia, who was kind of his ally at various points during this war. Um, after losing a huge number of troops... And here's the thing. So he marches into Russia. It gets roll call real fast. He loses a huge number of troops and has to march back. And then all the other countries who he defeated earlier now see that he's weak and they gang up on him again. And as a result, the empire falls apart. So you can see here in this map that the areas, right, see France and then all of these areas that are in this sort of medium orange. Those are all the French uh French Empire and countries that he was variously in control of. All the sort of reddish colors, that's the dependent states, as in states he had conquered and now are kind of part of the empire. Um, this color in here that you can see with Austria and Russia, they were supposed, they're, you know, allies of France for the most part. And then at war with Napoleon were these countries that were still in blue. So even though the rest of Europe had fallen, Sweden and Great Britain and Ireland hadn't totally fallen to um, and Portugal had not totally fallen to France yet. But this is what the map looked like during the height of Napoleon's power. Now, he was unsuccessful in unifying Europe, and it broke back down into its individual countries. Um, but he did, while he was emperor, put in place this Napoleonic code, this code of laws that's still influential today. Um, under this code, all people were equal before the law. There were fair taxes, not you know, less taxes on the incredibly rich like it had been in the old way of doing the French legal system. Uh, you had a trial by jury, not just a trial by nobles or a trial by judges. Um, and there was general religious freedom, so you could practice whatever religion you wanted to. Um, there was an awakening of feelings of nationalism and pride in your country uh, during this time period, in part because Napoleon was conquering these other countries, and that unified those people into seeing themselves as, this is us, and clearly French and Napoleon, that's them. So us versus them created a nationalist idea. Then the Congress of Vienna comes in after Napoleon to try and put Europe back in balance, to keep France from gaining all of that power back again. And they had this idea at this conference, all these countries coming together to try and reform Europe, uh, that there should be a balance of power in Europe. And the goal of that balance of power doctrine was to make sure that no one nation, even the nations at this conference, would become so powerful that they would threaten the safety of all the other nations. Uh, also during this conference, they restored a lot of monarchies that had fallen to revolutions, so sort of pushing back the clock and rolling back democracy and representative government in a lot of places. Um, there resulted a new political map of Europe as they redrew lines to try and figure out who's going to be in charge of what after this crazy Napoleon conquering everything and 
blowing up state lines and stuff. Um, and then there were new political philosophies that became clearly set apart during this time period. Liberalism, which is that you like change and want to see more change in the world, and conservatism, that you sh think you should stick more with the old ways, the tried and true. And we'll talk more about that in class. But here, again, is Napoleon's empire, you can see. And then here's Europe after the Congress of Vienna. So there's lots of little states that are back under the control of monarchies, and you can see that France is now restricted to just this purple area and Corsica. And that's all that belongs to them. They set up some borderline states to keep France in check, and then fortify those border states to help keep them in check. And here's just a side mention of nationalism, because it's an incredibly important concept. Nationalism is a sense of unity binding the people of a state together. It's an identification with that state, not just with the other people, but with this country that you build together, an acceptance of the idea that that state has particular goals, and that you share those goals because you're part of that nation, because you have nationalist ideas. So it grew in the 1800s because of economic competition uh, between these European nations, but also the democratic ideals that came out of all these revolutions that we've already talked about. And also national pride as countries began to become more organized together and they had more solidified uh, sets of languages and education. That all started to build up this idea of what a nation was. Um, but the problem was that few borders in Europe were based on national identity, and in particular there used to be lots of monarchs that ruled over multiple different groups of people who had uh, individual identities. So you'd have a multi-ethnic empire, a multinational empire, uh, and as a result, even after the Congress of Vienna, especially after the Congress of Vienna, uh, you had countries, empires, that controlled lots of nations, and that would cause some real conflict real soon. But we'll hear more about that soon.